Good morning. Yeah. Yeah. May I invite everyone to sit down? Good morning. Good morning. So I'm Martha Minow. I'm the dean here at Harvard Law School. And it gives me just enormous pleasure to welcome you all to the, this uh, really fascinating conference, Reconsidering the Insular Cases. I have a confession to make. I went to law school. I went to a good law school. I never heard of the insular cases. I taught constitutional law. My book didn't even have the insular cases. That is one of the reasons for this conference. There are now Harvard Law students, and I hope law students all over the country who are hearing about the insular cases. But more importantly, I think that there is just incredible historical importance and contemporary relevance to the set of issues that are represented by these cases that are entering their 100th anniversary. There's importance about equality, about citizenship, about sovereignty, about territory that has a resonance for the United States and resonance for other countries. And I think that this chance to bring together absolutely outstanding scholars, lawyers, judges, and others to think about this conjunction of questions at this moment is an opportunity for us all. I want to give my heartfelt thanks to the organizers of this conference, Professors Gerald Newman and Tamiko Brown-Nagan. And you'll be hearing from them as they moderate panels. And now I'm going to get out of the way, because I have a lot to learn. Good morning to all of you. So wonderful to see so many of you here at this conference and at this panel. The panel where we consider the historical uh, perspective on the insular cases, historical perspectives and lessons. We have a distinguished panel of scholars who will talk about the history of the cases. Uh, they'll give you some background on the cases. We'll talk about uh, law and society. We'll talk about politics. I think it's going to be an exciting panel. Uh, I think this will be a panel that will disprove that old adage that history is just one damn thing after the other. <laughs> <laughs> now, let me introduce our experts. First, we have Professor Christina Duffy Ponza. She's a professor of law at Columbia Law School. Her work focuses on American legal history. She's the co-editor of Foreign in a Domestic Sense, Puerto Rico, American Expansion, and the Constitution. She's also the author of several articles and essays on the constitutional implications of American territorial expansion. Professor Ponza currently is working on a constitutional and international legal history of American empire in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. She holds a JD from Yale, an MPhil from Cambridge, and AB and PhD degrees from Princeton. Next, we have in the far right, Dr. Efren Rivera Ramos, who is the former dean and professor at the School of Law at the University of Puerto Rico. He is the author of The Legal Construction of Identity, The Judicial and Social Legacy of American Colonialism in Puerto Rico. He's written extensively on the relationship between the US and Puerto Rico and holds 
an LLM from this law school, a PhD in law and social theory from the University College in London, and a BA and JD from University of Puerto Rico. And then finally, we have Bartholomew Sparrow, <coughs> who is a professor of government at the University of Texas at Austin. He too is an author <coughs> of The Insular Cases and the Emergence of American Empire, among many other books, articles, and book chapters. He's been a fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, the Shorenstein Center on Media, Politics, and Public Policy, and the Harry S. Truman Library Institute. Now, here's how we'll proceed in the session. The panelists will each speak for about 20 minutes, no longer than 20 minutes, please. Then we'll go to q and I'll first pose a couple of questions. Then we want you to engage them in conversation, so be ready as you're to, to pose uh, good questions for them. Uh, we'll have them speak in the order in which they're listed on the program, so first we'll hear from Professor Ponta. Is it okay if I close it? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Good morning. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here to speak to you about a topic I care about uh, greatly. I want to thank Professors Newman and Brown Nagin for the invitation to be here, uh, and Jennifer Pedraza for her uh, logistical help. Um, since I'm kicking things off, I'm going to start uh, with a few minutes of uh, background, as Professor Brown Nagin promised. Um, I'm going to just talk a little bit about what the insular cases are for anyone here who uh, still doesn't um, know. I'm going to draw on the so-called standard narrative, although my previous scholarship uh, has been about challenging that narrative. Uh, and my remarks today are uh, going to be an argument for trying to see the insular cases from different perspectives. Um, but to really get the value of that, it's good to know what the basic narrative is. Uh, and then I will consider some other angles. Uh, I'm going to consider uh, two other angles in particular after I do a, a, a quick review of what the insular cases are. I'm going to talk about the Cuban Constitution of 1901. And then I'm going to talk about Puerto Rican autonomists in the late 19th century. Um, it's, it's a lot to cover, but I'm going to try to be efficient. Um, in talking about these two other stories, I'm drawing on a project that I've been working on for some time and have had to defer uh, for a few years, and I'm returning to now. And this conference provides really the ideal occasion uh, for seeing uh, what it is that 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 examining those perspectives and different stories uh, gains one in trying to understand the period around 1898 and the significance of the insular cases, and here's what I mean by that. Um, when I set out to work on uh, the history of American empire, um, I, I had already done a lot of work on the insular cases, and I set myself the goal of writing a constitutional history of American empire that didn't mention the insular cases. Um, and uh, needless to say, that was going to be a draft uh, to be revisited to include the insular cases once again. But, but the idea was, what can I find if I, if I remove uh, the long shadow of the insular cases? What are the insular cases erasing? What are they displacing? What do we lose? Um, uh, given their dominance uh, in the constitutional history of Puerto Rico's annexation and American empire. And it turns out when you try to write a constitutional history uh, of American empire without looking at the insular cases, uh, you find a lot. Um, and so what I want to do is talk about what I found uh, briefly and then turn around and see what it is it helps me see about the insular cases. All right, so that's the project. Brief review of the insular cases two other stories about American empire, and then what do they show us about the insular cases? I am just now starting to make sense of that last question, um, so I will probably leave you with more food for thought than definitive conclusions. First, what are the insular cases? In 1898, the United States goes to war with Spain, the Spanish-American 
war, so-called. Um, ostensibly, the United States intervened in a conflict between Cuba and the United States to liberate Cuba. Cuba had already been fighting on and off for 30 years and had begun most recently in 1895, uh, the last phase of its fighting uh, for independence from Spain, and the United States decided to come in and help Cuba finish off what it started. And in the war resolution, uh, there was something called the Teller Amendment, and it was a disclaimer which said, this is not a war of conquest. We are coming in to help liberate Cuba. U.S. comes in. Uh, war is famously short. Uh, the United States defeats Spain rather quickly and uh, proceeds to occupy Cuba and to, yes, conquer Puerto Rico, the Philippines, and Guam. Um, so although the war was famously short, uh, the armed struggle gave way to constitutional struggle with lasting consequences, uh, a struggle that continues today. At the time, the annexation of Puerto Rico, the Philippines, and Guam uh, and the, the events leading to the annexation and then the annexation gave rise to what we remember as the debate uh, over imperialism. And the question was, can the United States take territories and their peoples without, at some point, making them states? Can we take them and keep them as colonies consistent with our constitutional framework? Um, rhetorically, the question was phrased as, does the Constitution follow the flag? That phrase had a history we could talk about, um, but it, it is revived in this context and the debate is saturated with the racist attitudes of the time. So on the one side, imperialists argue, we can take these people. Um, they are not prepared to govern themselves. We can govern them. Maybe we can teach them how to govern themselves and we can sort out what to do with them finally later. And the anti-imperialists said, no, we can't. We, uh, if we take territories, we have to make them states. And therefore, let's get rid of them immediately, because we don't want these people of other races and cultures and habits and languages and so on um, to be part of the United States. So on both sides, it was either they don't know how to govern themselves, we'll govern them, or no, we don't want to have anything to do with them. Um, those were the opposing, the so-called imperialist and anti-imperialist sides in the debate. The question makes its way to the Supreme Court in the insular cases of 1901. The leading case, Downs versus Bidwell, uh, considered a dispute over duties, and the question was, is Puerto Rico part of the United States, as that phrase is used in the uniformity clause? But the implications of the holding went beyond the uniformity clause. The Supreme Court held that Puerto Rico, and by implication, the other new territories, belonged to but were not a part of the United States, that they were foreign to the United States in a domestic sense, a phrase that mystified people at the time and does still, mm -hmm. that they were not incorporated into the United States, giving rise to the category of unincorporated territories, which is what Puerto Rico and Guam and other territories are today. Um, so it created this distinction that no one had thought that did not exist before then in constitutional law between incorporated territories, part of the United States and on their way to statehood, and unincorporated territories belonging to but not a part of the United States and not necessarily on their way to statehood. Um, so the two basic consequences of the case is first, constitutional protections, it was said, did not apply in these territories unless they were fundamental. And second, as I said, these territories had no ultimate guarantee of statehood. Those were supposed to be the two basic consequences of the insular cases. These holdings evolved in two related but distinct doctrinal lines, cases dealing with the applicability of the Constitution in the territories where turned out over time most rights did apply, but how they did and what their content was, was and continues to be debated. Um, and then the line of cases on the extraterritorial applicability of the Constitution, that is abroad, mm -hmm. in foreign territory, where abroad uh, can be complicated, um, as one can see in the most recent case in this line, Boomer DNV Bush, which held that the right to habeas uh, applies to detainees in Guantanamo, right? Uh, Guantanamo not being properly foreign, uh, in uh, the sense that might have uh, led to a different holding, right? So the court said, 
that Guantanamo was subject to de facto sovereignty, even if not de jure, and therefore habeas applied. Boumediene, this is here is where I wrap up my summary of uh, the so-called standard narrative. Boumediene contains a tantalizing statement. Uh, Kennedy wrote that it may well be that over time the ties between the United States and any of its unincorporated territories strengthen in ways that are of constitutional significance. My reaction to that statement is that talk is cheap. Um, it's easy enough to walk in like a bull in a china shop. Um, and the statement has really, you know, it's gotten a lot of attention in places that uh, Kennedy may or may not have had clearly in focus, somewhat in mind, but not so sure they were clearly in focus for him. Um, and there are people in this room fighting to make something of that statement, and I admire their emotional fortitude um, and indefatigability. But leaving the standard narrative there, let me turn to the second part of my remarks where I look at the insular cases from another angle by setting them aside uh, and returning to 1898 um, and uh, talking about uh, other constitutional narratives of empire in the time. So uh, another way to put what the project was, right, a, a constitutional history of American empire that doesn't look at the insular cases, another way of thinking about that is I wanted to take aim at that phrase, does the Constitution follow the flag, which has been driving me crazy since I started mm -hmm. thinking about the insular cases, bothers me on numerous levels. Who said the flag could go? Who said that the Constitution follows it as, as if propelled by its own agency, erasing the fact that there are those in power responsible for deciding whether the flag goes and that the Constitution follows it if it's going to follow, etc. There's a lot one could argue within that phrase. But today I want to focus on another objection uh, that I have to that phrase, which is that it assumes tacitly, it assumes, I guess assumptions are tacit, that there's one Constitution following one flag where in fact, a constitutional history of American empire has to see, involves multiple flags, constitutional traditions, and histories. So you have, and empires. You have Spanish empire, Puerto Rican constitutionalism, Cuban constitutionalism, constitutionalism in the Americas, imperial, national. This is a story of plural legalities. Multiple constitutionalisms are really what's constitutive of imperial constitutionalism. And so that's what I want to open up in the rest of my talk. So first, on Cuba. Recall that the US occupied Cuba. So it did disclaim de jure sovereignty, but it occupied Cuba. That occupation lasted until 1902. And during it, Cubans drafted a constitution for themselves. This is what they'd been aiming for all along. They wanted their own constitution. So they were, in some, they were ordered to do it by the military government, but they need not have been. That was the goal. Um, the convention consisted entirely of Cuban delegates, although they operated under the long shadow of the military occupation and um, were subject to plenty of pressure behind the scenes. But they forged ahead and produced a constitutional document in early 1901, a constitutional text. And then in a striking display of sort of, uh, well, uh, arrogant interventionism, Congress passed what you may all remember from your high school years is the Platt Amendment. Well, some of you know it better than that. Um, a list of provisions that were part of an amendment to a military appropriation statute that Congress dictated Cuba had to accept before the US would withdraw the military occupation. These provisions included uh, a provision that said that Cuba would consent to a US right to intervene at will whenever the US deemed it necessary to protect Cuba's independence, ironically enough. And another provision uh, directing Cuba to sell or lease Guantanamo to the United States, hence Guantanamo, hence everything we've seen, mm -hmm. boom again. Um, so these are provisions that, that one has a sense are part of the history of the relationship between the US and Cuba. Something that gets less attention is that uh, the, the Platt Amendment, the text of the legislation, also required that Cuba insert these provisions into its constitution, okay? including a provision consenting to the US right to intervene in Cuba. So as you can imagine, this caused an uproar 
um, and led to an amazing debate uh, at the, uh, among the delegates to the Constitutional Convention um, who, who argued amongst themselves about what to do, what constitutions were for, what it meant to put this in the Constitution. Nobody was happy about it, but the debate was substantive and intense, and they sent a delegation to talk to Ellie Hugh Root at the War Department, who was behind the Platt Amendment. The Cubans in this delegation said, uh, this is not the way you do constitutions. We want to do it like you did it. That is, we want to do our constitution, and then, once we're established as an independent republic, we'll turn to international relations. And Root said, no, let's do it differently this time. Let's settle the basic premises of our international relations right here in your constitution. And uh, what he explained was, this is really just the Monroe Doctrine. Remember that? US on European non-interventionism, right? OK, you stay over there. We'll stay over here, and we'll be in charge of the Americas. OK, so Root says, this is just the Monroe Doctrine with international force. Okay, the world doesn't accept our unilateral declaration of the Monroe Doctrine, but if you all put it in your constitution, then it'll have a formal legal status and you will have consented to it and the world will accept it. So let's do it that way, okay? So bracketing the obvious problem of coerced consent, uh, at first blush, right, it's an intriguing idea. Use a subsidiary constitution to entrench asymmetrical international relations that after all are a part of the reality of these two places, right? So intriguing until one remembers that this is what the US in a different version had done all along, okay? Since forever, expand into foreign territory, annex it, and require the adoption of a constitution entrenching asymmetrical relations before admission into statehood. Okay? Not the same thing to do it to a country that is supposed to be formally independent, and yet the parallels are striking. And for me, the insight is that imperial constitutionalism uh, goes back to the beginning. That US Constitution, that the US Constitution didn't suddenly become imperial in this period, right? And that it is imperial in core constitutive ways. Uh, ways constitutive of US nationhood. Uh, so seen in this light, the Platt Amendment looks like a guarantee clause for the Americas. Okay, think of it in those terms and you begin to see how core uh, an expansionist uh, idea of asymmetrical relations codified in law is to US constitutionalism. I could say more, but I want to turn to my Puerto Rican autonomists before my time is up. And so, without uh, any hope of fully doing them justice, let me give you a little bit of another story. Puerto Ricans and Cubans um, were no strangers to debates about imperialism. They had spent the entire course of the 19th century uh, seeking what they called autonomy from Spain, greater self-government in that colonial setting. So recall that in the first third of the 19th century, Spain lost its American colonies except for Cuba and Puerto Rico and held its Pacific possessions. And in the rest of the 19th century, these remaining colonies struggled for greater autonomy. They had military governors, various degrees of martial law, Spaniards born in Spain controlled local government positions. It was a through and through colonial setting, and uh, uh, the local, the native-born uh, Puerto Rican leadership uh, struggled for greater autonomy. That was, there were also separatists, but the overwhelming political support was for autonomy. And what that meant changed over time and was contested, but a phrase that kind of became attached to it was the maximum decentralization possible within national unity, okay? Greater self government within this larger national, referring to Spain as the nation, whole. For our purposes, um, I just want to focus on a debate among two factions of the autonomists that become significant in the moment of transition to the United States. One group of autonomists argued that autonomy meant self-government according to constitutional Republican principles. They argued we need an alliance with a Spanish political party that supports the Republican principles we believe in, 
That's the only way to get the autonomy we want. The other group said autonomy means self-government, which means native Puerto Ricans in power. First we get power, then we sort out exactly what that government is going to look like. And they shared lots of principles, but the approach was different in ways that became substantive, a deep disagreement, right? That faction said, first we need an alliance with a Spanish political party that will get us in power, then we sort out the details. And that argument meant, let's make an alliance with a monarchical party in Spain. Those are the only parties that have power in Spain. So let's, uh, let's form an alliance with one of those. Then we'll have autonomy. Then we can sort out the details. So this uh, dispute, I'm oversimplifying it, no question. But this dispute turned into a dispute about the nature of autonomy uh, in which the former group said, you know, an alliance with monarchists will betray, it's like giving up autonomy to get autonomy. It doesn't really matter who precisely is in power as long as the right form of government is in place because that kind of government is fully representative anyway. Some native-born Puerto Ricans will be in, in power. Maybe some Spanish-born uh, residents of Puerto Rico will be in power. The idea is to have a particular kind of government that subjects everybody to the rule of law. And the latter said, you'll never get there this way. Um, power means we're in power, and let's do that first. The debate is never resolved, because what actually happens is that Spain promises special laws over and over throughout the 19th century without ever granting any of them or specifying what their content will be. Um, until a few months before the annexation of Puerto Rico, in the last minute craziness of the war, Spain grants Puerto Rico and Cuba charters of autonomy, which turn out to be, putting aside what their substance was, which was actually quite a robust autonomy, too little too late. The United States declares war on the day that the Puerto Rican legislature was to convene. Uh, the, legislature, the, the legislature then, the opening is postponed, meets in July, a week later the United States annexes Puerto Rico, and that's the end of the autonomous experiment under Spain, and this brings us to the moment that I want to focus on, that I focus on in a much longer paper um, we could talk about someday. Um, that moment immediately after annexation sees both autonomous factions coalesce into one, they form separate political parties. It's, let's not be too idealistic, right? Two different political parties. Both support statehood in the Union. And it's striking for the historian to see, you know, it's, it's almost from one day to the next, these Puerto Rican Spaniards seeking maximum de decentralization within national unity under Spain suddenly annexed by the United States, whip around, everybody's for statehood. And historians have not, in fact, in my view, done justice to that moment. U.S. historians don't even know anything about it. Puerto Rican historians, uh, I think, on the whole, without making statements that are too sweeping, but there's a sense of sort of this being an uncomfortable and embarrassing moment of completely capitulating to the new imperial master. Um, and it is you know, passed over quickly with varying degrees of allusion to this sort of awkward, thank you, business. Um, and my view is that this does not give the autonomists nearly enough credit. They saw something in US constitutional federalism that they somehow thought could transcend national, cultural, and linguistic barriers that, that completely dominate our thinking really on so many sides of this debate today, right? And what exactly they saw is what I was working on when I had to defer this project. So I can't really tell you exactly what it is, but the point is to dismiss it <laughs> as, you know, I, you know, I, these, I don't know why these collaborators are so excited here. You know, this is an empire. They saw something and it was rooted, and you can, I shouldn't fully dismiss, I, well, I, can, see, I can see glimmers of what they saw. It, it, it's in their platforms, their party platforms, dis describing why it is they support statehood. How it is they think it can accommodate, there's allusions to, to, to the differences that are gonna be possible to encompass 
within US American federalism. And so uh, the goal is to try to see what it is they saw and to recover it from what happened, right? Which is, turning back to look at the insular cases, right? That the United States through the insular cases and in other ways, first through congressional legislation and then through the insular cases, rejects that vision. It's a path not taken. They, Americans, US Americans, can't quite wrap their minds around what the autonomous can. And the answer is no, you're too different. You're too different from us and so you need to be subordinate. And, and we'll sort out what to do with you in full later on, okay? So the insular cases, and with this I conclude, have been remembered for being overly creative in making up this distinction between incorporated and unincorporated territories that didn't exist before, and in sort of devising a new bizarre uh, uh, constitutional regime of spatial exception for these places that the United States couldn't fully absorb. They did make some stuff up for sure, but when you compare it to what the autonomous could imagine, it's actually pretty narrow, hardened, and short-sighted. It's easy enough to say, you're not like us, so we're gonna subject, to, to subject you to a second-class status. Much harder to imagine that, that multinational, multi-constitutional polity that the autonomists were grasping for. The insular cases displaced all that, and seeing what they displaced sheds greater light on them. I will leave you with that. Thank you. Thank you. I told you this history would be exciting. <laughs> Professor Rivera Ramos. <laughs> well, um, good morning. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to congratulate the Law and History and the Human Rights Programs <coughs> of Harvard Law School for hosting this conference, which comes in a very auspicious moment, I think. And I also thank the organizers for inviting me to participate in this panel with such esteemed colleagues. Uh, let me go straight to my presentation. Most critiques of the insular cases um, lead to the conclusion that those early 20th, 20th century decisions should be abandoned, either because they perpetrated a great injustice against the peoples of the territories at the time of their adoption, or because they no longer hold water in light of current political values. As we embark on the project of reconsidering the insular cases, it is worthwhile to pose several basic questions regarding this notion. Should the insular cases be simply discarded? Can they be simply discarded? given the constitutional text and the interpretative gloss the cases have acquired. And <laughs> lastly, what do we exactly mean when we say that the insular cases should be repealed? In the first part of this presentation, I will limit myself to raising additional queries that flow from these basic questions without pretending to give answers at this moment. And in the second part, I will briefly address some other considerations. Now, let's go to the first part. For the sake of argument, let's say that the insular cases and their further judicial elaborations stand for at least the following 13 propositions. A, the United States has an inherent sovereign right to acquire foreign territory. B, as a corollary to that right, the US government has the power to govern the territory so, so acquired. C, the territorial clause of the US Constitution grants Congress plenary powers to govern US territories. D, there is a distinction to be made between something called incorporated territory and something else called unincorporated territory. E, incorporated, incorporated territory is to be considered an integral part of the US, while unincorporated territory is only a pertinent to, but not a part of the US. F, not all 
provisions of the U.S. Constitution apply in the territories, whether they are incorporated or not. But there may be some provisions that, ap that apply in incorporated territory that do not apply in unincorporated territory, like the right to a jury trial, for example. What constitutional provisions apply in the territories is up to the court to determine. G, Congress may decide, in accordance to its plenary powers, to extend all federal laws to the territories under US jurisdiction. It also may provide that some laws will apply and others will not. H, political rights of full participation in the governance of the US, including representation in the US Congress and electing federal officials, have been granted only to residents of the states, not to those residing in the territories. I, regarding unincorporated territory, and for our argument's sake, let's not include here incorporated territory, which brings uh, other sorts of issues, but regarding unincorporated territory, Congress can dispose of the territory as it sees fit. And that includes providing for diverse forms of self-government without relinquishing its ultimate authority under the territorial clause, incorporating the territory into the US political community, admitting it as a state, or getting rid of the territory by granting it independence or even ceding it to another country. <coughs> now, Congress has the power to do all, all of those things. However, under the Constitution, it is not obligated to do any of them. J, the decision to incorporate or not an unincorporated territory belongs exclusively to Congress. K, the mere extension of US citizenship to its residents does not have the effect of incorporating a territory. L, Puerto Rico is to be considered an unincorporated territory of the US. And M, arguably for different reasons, the uniformity clause, the export clause, and the right to a trial by jury in local courts do not apply in Puerto Rico. Other clauses of the Constitution may not apply, but that is up uh, to the court to decide. Now, here are then 13 propositions that the insular cases can reasonably be said to stand for. There may be more at different levels of generality. The question is, which of those propositions would have to be repealed for the Constitution to be brought in line with current political values and aspirations. The abolition of which would be sufficient to surmount the acute criticism to which the cases have been subjected over the course of more than a century. Which of them are susceptible of abrogation given the text of the Constitution and its interpretative history? Which of them can be cast aside without causing a substantial change in the US political system as we know it? And lastly, which of those propositions the Supreme Court of the United States would be actually willing to supersede? Now, I do not have, do not have the time to examine each of those propositions under the lens of those inquiries. Let it be sufficient to say that they entail different levels of complexity. For example, it would be one thing for a court to decide that jury trials should be available in local courts in the unincorporated territory of Puerto Rico, thus repealing one aspect of the decision in Balzac versus Puerto Rico. Uh, and, but, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but it would be quite another to conclude that Puerto Rico has to be regarded incorporated territory, thus departing from one aspect of the decision in Downs and one aspect of the rationale in Balzac. Both conclusions, however, would still remain within the discursive framework produced by the insular cases. 
a more substantial departure would be to abolish altogether the distinction between incorporated and unincorporated territory introduced in Justice White's concurring opinion in Downs and accepted by a majority of the court in Door v. U.S. A still more radical stance would be for the court to proclaim that the territory clause should not apply at all in the territories acquired in 1898 and thereafter, returning to the kind of argument adopted by the majority in the Dred, in the Dred Scott case, by the way. But even those results, even those results, radical as they might seem, would not have the same implications as those emanating from a determination by the court that the residents of the present territories should have full participatory rights in federal decision making, or from a ruling that the US Congress may not keep the residents of unincorporated territory in a permanent condition of political subordination and is therefore obligated to provide for a democratic resolution of their political status, meaning admitting the territory as a state or granting it its independence. These uh, latter propositions have hugely different consequences than those attached to some of the others mentioned before. So at this stage of the game, then, what should be the level, depth, and scope of the claim that the insular cases should be abandoned? And what are its possibilities at each level? I am content with leaving those questions on the table for now. <laughs> and then I will go on to the second part of my presentation. Um, I would like, in the time remaining, to move on to something else. I will say a few words about what I consider the long-term socio-historical and political effects of the insular cases and their sequel. I will then conclude with a comment on the possibilities left open to us to address the main concerns of the people of the current territories after more than a hundred years of living under the shadow of those decisions. I am assuming that in the case of Puerto Rico, the central question is, what can be done to do away with its colonial relationship with the US? In the other territorial possessions, there may be other ways of formulating their principal claims. Let me begin by stating that I agree with my dear colleague and friend, Christina Duffy, in one of her previous um, articles, that the insular cases did not have the effect of creating an extra constitutional zone in the so-called unincorporated territories. On the contrary, the decisions were, in, were intended to provide a constitutional basis to US rule over those lands. They legitimized via constitutional argument the possibility of an indefinite condition of political subordination. In that sense, the insular cases put the US Constitution once again at the service of colonialism. I have argued before and still believe that one of the main results of the positions that prevailed in the insular cases was to give Congress very wide latitude in dealing with the new possessions. The need for that flexibility was premised on the perception by most of the justices, shared by legislators, military and executive officers, scholars, sectors of the press, and others, that those recently acquired possessions posed new challenges and were somehow to be treated differently from previous acquisitions. There is ample language in the opinions that supports this contention. Justice McKenna, for example, referred to this need, quote unquote, for flexibility in his dissent in De Lima. Justice Brown explicitly stated that, and I quote, a false step at this time might be fatal to the development of the American empire, unquote. 
writing for the majority in Door, Justice Day underlined that the framers of the Treaty of Paris intended to reserve to Congress, and I quote, a free hand in dealing with the newly acquired possessions. And in Balzac, Chief Justice Taft expressed that the real issue of the insular cases had been the extent of the power of Congress to deal with these, and I quote, new conditions and requirements, unquote. Flexibility. The insular cases represented both a continuation and a break from the past. The continuity included resorting to concepts such as the long existing plenary powers doctrine and creating a symbolic space to be inhabited by peripheral populations similar to those that had been designed for African Americans, Native Americans, new immigrants, and women. The break involved the message that neither Congress nor the court should feel excessively constrained by previous doc decisions or doctrines, even those that had been developed for the governance of the former territories of the nation. In a sense, the court was constructing for itself and for Congress a relatively clean slate upon which to write the future of the new possessions. This was one of the principal symbolic effects of the doctrine of incorporation. In the longer term, the insular cases have had, in my view, the following social, political, and ideological effects. Firstly, they created a discursive universe that included categories, concepts, approaches, justifications, and understandings that have controlled the nation's and the territory's way of thinking, analyzing, and imagining solutions even to this day. We all have become inhabitants of the conceptual territory carved out by the justices in those decisions. Secondly, the insular cases constituted a new legal and political subject, the resident of unincorporated territory. This new social agent would be endowed with entitlements and obligations. The residents of the territories would be capable of willing, making claims, and acting, but they also would be submitted to the full political authority of Congress. That authority was considered legitimate by virtue of the inherent powers of the US as a sovereign nation and by the textual foundation provided by the territorial clause of the US Constitution. Thirdly, like all salient legal events, the cases constructed a context for future action. Most relevant actors in the territorial drama have proceeded under the assumption that the claims, counterclaims, congressional legislation, executive determinations, and even the processes by virtue of which the colonial condition of the territories are supposed to be resolved, all those things have to be formulated, designed, and executed under the fundamental premises adopted by the insular cases and their progeny. This is a very powerful constraining effect indeed. But the justices in those cases did something else. They produced an understanding akin to a political question doctrine to be applied in the context of the territories. Chief Justice Taft vigorously consolidated this viewpoint in the Balzac case. According to this conception, there is a distinction to be made between constitutional and political claims. Constitutional claims, such as those pertaining to certain fundamental rights, due process, freedom of expression, and the like, are for the court to decide. 
But political claims, as understood by the court, for example, those relating to participation rights or to the definition of the political condition of the territories are for Congress or for the people of the United States to determine. In that determination, Congress has paramount power, except for the constitutional uh, limitations regarding constitutional claims imposed by the Constitution itself as interpreted by the court. Now, the historical evidence shows that in this respect, the court has always acted in accordance with congressional policy. It is in this terrain, and not necessarily in the judicial sphere, that lie the possibilities to move forward with the resolution of the condition of the territories. Of course, these possibilities confront enormous difficulties. The US Congress has more than 500 members. Puerto Rico and the other territories are not even in the radar of most of them. Moreover, extracting a consensus on the future of the territories in that complex, partisan, and highly divisive body has proven to be a veritable cha challenge. Yet, this seems to be the most viable route to accomplish the goal of bringing the relationship between the US and its territories in line with current notions of self-determination, democracy, and human rights. Congress, however, needs prodding. The pressure has to come from the peoples of the territories themselves, from sympathetic sectors of the American people, perhaps even from the White House, and from the international community. Thank you. Professor Sparrow. Thank you for the introduction and my thanks to the conference organizers, Professors Newman and Brown Nagin and uh, Dean Minow. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and see friends and uh, acquaintances. I should say something about my title, mm -hmm. The Centennial of Ocampo v. United States, Revisiting the Insular Cases. Conferences tend to revolve around anniversaries, not the case here, as you're no doubt familiar with. But there's something arbitrary about multiples of 10 by which to commemorate persons and events, the tyranny of base 10, if you will. So it's partly tongue in cheek that I mention the centennial of Ocampo v. United States, a decision in which 100 years ago in May, Justice Malon Pitney ruled for unanimous court that a resident of the Philippines was not entitled to constitutional protection with respect to the rights to a prelim preliminary finding of probable cause before indictment. Justice Pitney relied on Hawaii versus Mankichi, Doar, Dowdle, as precedents to rule that the Constitution did not apply of its own force. He also cited Trono v. United States to distinguish Ocampo from Kempner v. United States, both double jeopardy cases. Although Ocampo may be an obscure libel case involving the Philippines under US sovereignty, the court's ruling represented a continuation of its restrictions of civil liberties in the US island territories. I want to use the Ocampo decision as a jumping off point for three remarks, three sets of remarks. A first observation, and a simple point that bears restatement has been already suggested, is that the insular cases undermine Americans' fundamental beliefs of the United States as a nation of states, of the areas of US sovereignty and representative government being coterminous, and of beliefs in the progressive eradication of de jure political discrimination within the United States. A second is that Ocampo and the other insular cases and their legacies, as been suggested too, remain hidden in American public and political discourse. A third is a consideration of why the rulings in the insular cases persist. 
So let me take these in turn. The decision in Ocampo is, cons is consistent with a lengthy set of court decisions, some well preceding the insular cases, that establish that the Constitution, that the Congress has plenary authority over the inhabitants and in areas under U.S. sovereignty, a characterization that applied to the Creoles, Cajuns, French, Spanish, and free blacks of the Louisiana Purchase, the Spanish Indians and Anglo-Americans of West and East Florida, a handful of British and white inhabitants of the Oregon Territory, and the Mexican and Spanish descendants in the Mexican Session and later Gadsden Purchase, and this also applied to the inhabitants of Hawaii and Alaska and to the peoples of Puerto Rico, the Philippines, and Guam following the Spanish-American War, just as it did with the United States' subsequent insular possessions. With the partial exception of the Northern Marianas, and I shall return to the Northern Marianas, an area added by the United, areas added by the United States have been imperial annexations in the sense of occupation and control of a territory and its inhabitants have been without their consent. Neither did the United States acquire its empire blindly, unintentionally, accidentally, and really in spite of ourselves, as Henry Luce of Time said, or through, quote, the sheer genius of Americans and not because we choose to go into the politics of the world in the words of Woodrow Wilson. Nor was, was it the case, per Teddy Roosevelt, that America, like it or not, would have to play a large role in the world. The overseas territories were acquired deliberately for reasons of strategic, political, and economic advantage, uh, consistent with the policies promulgated by US presidents, cabinet secretaries, party leaders, military officials, and other political and strategic experts. They were not acquired in a fit of absence of mind, and in fact, the United States wanted to play a large role in the world. This plenary of power of Congress under the Territory Clause was, of course, solidified by the Supreme Court in Downs v. Bidwell and the incorporation doctrine of Justice White, and it was manifest in Ocampo. But for Chief Justice Fuller, the majority in Downs was establishing that the United States could, quote, acquire an organized and settled province of another sovereignty and keep it like a disembodied shade in an intermediate state of ambiguous existence for an indefinite period, absolutely subject to the will of Congress, irrespective of constitutional provisions. Justice Marshall Har Harlan, in his dissent, likewise put it out that the Downs majority was making the Constitution internally inconsistent. Congress has no existence and can exercise no authority outside the Constitution, he wrote. Still less is it true that Congress can deal with the new territories just as other nations have done or may do with their new territories. And of course, he's referring to Britain, France, Spain, Portugal, Netherlands, and so forth, uh, Russia, uh, Japan, in the age of imperialism in the uh, late 19th century. But the majority in Downs was instead finding that, this is for John Marshall Harlan, that Congress may, by action taken outside the Constitution, and graft upon our Republican institutions a colonial system such as it exists under monarchical governments. The insular cases remain law, and a series of cases in the territorial courts, district courts, appeals courts, and a few in the Supreme Courts have applied to one of the more of the territories and, in fact, entrenched and further established uh, this uh, second tier status of uh, the re residents and citizens of the island territories. So the Fourth Amendment right to protection from search and seizures does not apply as one of the fundamental rights accorded US citizens outside the states. The Fifth Amendment's right to indictment by grand jury in cases of felony, just as the Sixth Amendment right to a jury trial does not apply to unincorporated territories as fundamental rights. The Fifth and Fourteenth Amendment's equal protection clause do not apply. In a case, um, I'll just leave it at that. Uh, the Sixth Amendment's guarantees of trial by jury do not apply. The Tenth Amendment's guarantees that powers not enumerated in the Constitution are reserved to the states respectively, or the people has not been extended to the U.S. citizens residing in the territories. Persons presumably entitled to the Constitution's reserved powers as people of the United States 
for Justice Marshall and Loughborough versus Blake. Neither does the 14th Amendment apply to the US citizens regard, uh, residing in the territories. Nor do US citizens in the territories come under the protections of the 15th Amendment. The right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude, um, where it's clear that the racial, there's a racial dimension to the insular cases and to the status of the territories in the early 20th century. So it's hard to see the insular cases as dead letters or as constitutional aberrations, as Professor Eric Posner has uh, recently suggested. Yet this discrimination on the basis of geography seems grossly outdated in this, the second decade of the new millennium, in an area where the United States has deeply eroded, if not eliminated, de jure discrimination on the base of race and ethnicity, gender and religion. But of course, the spatial discrimination nonetheless persists for US citizens residing in the territories. Neither can the present condition be explained or, or justified by saying it is a political decision, as Judge Torella comments in his concurrence in Iguarta v. United States. No more so than can other judicial action against long-standing precedents on behalf of other powerless groups be explained away. The powerless groups, he writes, are ever caught in an untenable catch-22. He cites Caroline Products and Brown v. Board of Education. We might add Hammer v. Dagenhart or Hernandez versus Texas. Despite this important and fundamental reality, one that several here have studied at length, the insular cases remain obscure in mainstream political life. And this comes to my second point. That is the national politics of the 50 states. In the past 25 years, and here I was just looking at some news databases, the insular cases of any of the independent decisions of the cases have received only several dozen mentions in the press and no mention whatsoever in the broadcast media. Most of the mentions of the cases are in Hispanically speaking news, an online news site, um, in the official news of the US federal government, and the Virgin Island Daily News. The New York Daily News mentioned them a couple times, the Boston Globe and Associated Press twice each, the New York Times once, 25 years. Neither do they get mentioned by politicians, despite the interest in the 2008 and 2012 Puerto Rican presidential primaries or the recent downgrading in the Puerto Rican debt. And never have they been the subject of the mass media or academic public opinion surveys in the last 25 years. Only two Supreme Court general constitutional law cases, to my knowledge, feature Downs v. Bidwell, one of those very briefly, and they're still not a common feature of law school curricula. So there's a considerable disconnect then between the significant volume and prominence of the scholarship and books and law review articles on the insular cases, and many again by the people here, and the larger political discourse in Washington and within the 50 states. Only five Supreme Court cases in the last quarter century cite one or more of the insular cases, in fact with Boumediene, V. Bush being the most recent. Yet, one or more of the insular cases have been cited in dozens of cases heard in the federal appeals courts, circuit courts, and territorial courts, as I've suggested earlier. Um, but here, the insular cases, or the incorporation doctrine, has um, um, not been appealed successfully or been denied cert by the Supreme Court. So this is to say that they're very much politically alive, very much still with us. They just get scarce attention. We can see the incorporation doctrine of the insular cases as Mobius-like, as self-contradictory, as a recursive in logic terms, since some of the clause within the Constitution, one of its components, that is, is able to negate, to reverse the rest of the Constitution. So why does Congress's peculiar veiled authority over the areas beyond the electorate and citizens of the states prevail? And this takes me to my, takes me to my third set of remarks. My answer is that the authority of the Constitution and the Congress extended over its possessions in territories. The 34 states of the Union uh, were formerly uh, territories, and the United States right now possesses the largest territorial area of any country in the world, is very much a story of national power. That is, of the acquisition, expansion, and retention of national power. <clears throat> 
Thus, the determination that Martin Ocampo was not accorded the protections of the criminal due process under the Constitution is fully consistent with the story of Congress's sensitivity to and the U.S. Court's deference to security concerns. Boom and Deanne is an exception here, although we might wonder how the case might have been decided a few years earlier uh, rather than in 2008. In fact, as I've discussed elsewhere, U.S. policymakers sought control of Puerto Rico, Cuba, the Virgin Islands, Guam, Philippines, and American Samoa for strategic purposes to enhance the United States politically, military, and economically. The United States wanted these islands or island groups for their harbors and resources, not their inhabitants. So it seems that the, um, that the deal, the uh, uh, 1975 agreement for the acquisition of the Northern Marianas can be seen as a critical test. Now why the island residents wanted to annex the United States I think is pretty clear. Uh, economically fragile areas, and they'd receive financial subsidies, economic support, protections of U.S. law and enforcement and legal system, military defense, the potential economic growth from enhanced tourism, new investment in hotels, resorts, gambling facilities, and so forth, and trade opportunities to the development of new industries such as manufacturing and apparel. So, but the question is, well, why would the United States Congress agree, right? In an era of uh, Vietnam War, post-Watergate, uh, um, all sorts of crises of legitimacy, of uh, race, of uh, women's rights. Why would Congress agree to the covenant of the Marianas annexing new persons who are culturally dissimilar and at incomes far less uh, than uh, Americans in far away? So why would they Congress annex them? Well, I think the uh, text of the covenant agreement and the deliberations over that agreement bring this into uh, relief. Article 8 of the Covenant makes the Ford administration's strategic concerns quite clear. The Pentagon wanted to be able to lease every on the islands for airstrips, proving grounds, and other purposes. Indeed, according to the uh, agree Covenant Agreement, the United States secured long-term leases for military installations on almost 18,000 acres on two islands. There are a number of reasons for regarding these islands of strategic importance, the 1973 Interagency Group for the Micronesian Status Negotiations reported. Among them are location, proximity to Guam, Hawaii, and important trade routes, the many uncertainties confronting our, our continued tenure and operating rights in the areas close to the mainland of Asia, especially the Philippines, and the future need for training and logistical facilities in the area. The potential risks or threats which would arrive from the presence of military forces of unfriendly powers on one or several of these islands, and the need to meet contingencies in East Asia and the Indian Ocean. Likewise, the Deputy National Security Advisor, Brent Scowcroft, attributed the U.S. government's primary objective as being, quote, the denial of the area for use by third parties, U.S. control over the foreign and defense affairs of the Marianas, and the right to establish military bases on the island. The United States had, quote, broad national interests in the Northern Marianas. The Assistant Secretary of Defense um, told the Armed Forces Committee in 1975, not only did the United States have, quote, a specific responsibility for the defense of Hawaii, Midway, Johnston, Wake, and Guam Islands against unlawful or hostile actions, Robert Ellsworth said. It had also responsibility for air traffic control, rescue operations, and the protections of sea lanes in that ocean area between Hawaii and the Marianas. Gary Hart, Senator Gary Hart of Colorado, perhaps the foremost congressional opponent of the annexations, viewed the strategic rationale as the principal reason why the U.S. government sought sovereignty over the Northern Marianas. Yet the Department of Defense has never used the Marianas for military purposes, and in 2003, the Bush administration had the Navy stopped using Vieques as a proving ground, and the U.S. Navy closed Roosevelt Road's Naval Air Station in 2004. So how does this history apply to Puerto Rico and the other territories, since the U.S. Naval bases in Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands are obviously no longer needed to protect the Atlantic entrances to the Panama Canal, and since the United States has a clear command of the Blue Water? Well, Guam, it seems, holds the key. Its society and economy are dominated by the military with large Air Force, Navy, and Marine bases, and other facilities uh, occupy about a third of the land area, that is military facilities. U.S. service personnel currently total 12,000 persons, not counting dependents, 
Guam, one scholar of military bases finds, has the highest ratio of US military spending in military hardware, the highest proportion of land takings, and the worst environmental record of any US military base. And the Department of Defense plans to relocate 4,500 Marines with a third Marine Expeditionary Force from Okinawa to Guam, which includes support and dependents, which would make for a total of about 10,000 additional persons. These and other actions will increase the overall population by 25% on an island with over, a little over 16,000 non-military persons, and by some estimates, raise military land to 40% of the land area. This increased military presence will obviously have tremendous consequences on property values, the environment, rental prices, the demand for resources, goods, and services. With a not only a non-voting delegate in the House, Guam has effectively no control of the Department of Defense plans to expand the Marines and Air Force pr uh, presence. Conversely, those same citizens would have no voice in a decision by the Department of Defense to withdraw forces with the resulting economic depression that would follow for obvious reasons. S just as in 1975, uh, when the citizens of Guam had no say when the U.S. government temporarily relocated tens of thousands of Vietnam refugees to the island following the U.S. evacuation of Saigon and South Vietnam. None of the insular cases were decided in is isolation. The court's rulings would apply equally to the Puerto Rico and the Philippines since the Treaty of Paris and the U.S. Con Constitution applied to both. As Senator Orville Platt of Connecticut said in reference to the legal status of Puerto Rico and the Philippines, it is the first step that counts and the established a precedent that gives trouble. Almost all Americans were willing to annex Puerto Rico following the American War and almost none wanted to annex the Philippines. But there was the rub. There was no way to distinguish them in constitutional law or by the terms of the Treaty of Paris. The same logic, I suspect, applies here. To overrule the insular cases would endanger the US government's plenary control over Guam and the other territories and make responses to any contingency much more difficult. As one co commentator uh, said in reference to Downs v. Bidwell, an empire had to be constitutionally possible. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much to the panelists uh, for your remarks. They were so rich and uh, have provided a lot of food for thought uh, to all of us. Uh, and I'm sure many of you have questions. I have um, a few questions of my own. I'll limit myself to one initially. Um, and the question, I'd, I'd love to have uh, thoughts from all of you um, it picks up on something that Professor Sparrow um, just said that goes to, I think, the heart of the matter um, and a, a, an issue that is uh, really important to um, the question of how much resonance and knowledge um, citizens have about the insular cases. And here's, here's the thought. You said, Professor Sparrow, that the U.S. territories were acquired deliberately, strategically, and then you said, and there was a racial dimension mm -hmm. um, to the social context in which um, the territories were acquired. Which leads me to this question. Obviously, race was a part of the social context, but is racism essential to the holding of the cases? Is this a set of cases that we should think of like we think about Plessy? I've heard people make that comparison, which is a strong comparison. Or is this a set of cases where it's legitimate for the court to um, acknowledge that there was a racial context there, but to reaffirm the holding 
of the cases. How do you think about um, the role of race in the cases and the work that talking about that history can do um, as you try to gain leverage in uh, thinking about, rethinking the insular cases? Well, let me start at that since you, you, you put in my statement and say that, um, thanks, um, is that I think there's absolutely a racial dimension. I, mean, I don't think it's a, a, obviously a not, a, not a sole explanation, but it very much informs the cases and provides the backdrop. I mean, consider that something like over 75% of the land area was uh, settled by um, Euro-Americans, and it was because the indigenous population, American Indians, were mineralized, as Donald Mining puts it, right? So those populations would eventually grow and overtake. And so if those effective, um, let's say, Euro-Americans or Anglo control, then this was acceptable to Congress and to the voters uh, and the electorate. Um, and this is, in fact, what distinguishes Hawaii. You say, well, why is Hawaii an aberration? Well, the Hawaii was controlled by the Haley's, the descendants of um, missionaries, and controlled the, the setup of their own government, controlled the, the politics, the language, the resources of Hawaii. And so even though the vast majority are uh, not uh, Euro-Americans, uh, Hawaii was acceptable because of this control by uh, a white population. Um, so this is to say that in the, if uh, Puerto Rico, again, Puerto Rico was acceptable. It was the implications to the Philippines with almost 10 million uh, you know, Catholics at the time was not good. Certainly the 5% of Muslims wasn't good. And so this is, uh, you know, mile, thousands of miles away, this is really very unacceptable. So I think uh, the, the, the court and through Justice White says, well, how can we creatively find a way around this? And uh, and said, well, let's just, let's. I mean, the case law. You can go back to the case law, and there's, you know, it's, you could argue argue both sides about how the one might might decide the answer cases. In fact, many of them, as you're probably well aware, were five to four decisions, and they split, very controversial. You know, got the most attention of any case since um, Dred Scott, those first 1901 cases. And so um, this is to say that I think uh, I'd have no doubt if this were populated by uh, settlers, by a colonial, uh, Anglo a colonial population, or certainly uh, in the control of a uh, um, white population like Hawaii was, there would be no issue. Mm. So the second part of the question to remind you is how much purchase does one gain from talking about that aspect um, of the social context? Well, let me start here because I'm sure other people have things to say, and I, I would just say that um, uh, it seems to me that the um, that to the extent I mean, and Efren Rivera has written very nicely about this, talking about the the bizarre circumstances of U.S. citizens if they're state residents and they go to Puerto Rico and how they're disenfranchised, and it doesn't extend if you can go to you know, Mongolia, right, and you're still enfranchised, but if you go to Puerto Rico, you're disenfranchised, and he gives all sorts of permutations and all sorts of examples of this. And so it, it, it seems to me that it's, it's, it's kind of a carryover and legacy because um, one of the things I, I say to you is that there is, as Sandy Levinson says, and perhaps we'll hear this more in Samoa, there is kind of this notion of multicultural exception, that you have populations that are different, that you have different cultures, different nationalities, if you will, and these deserve some protection. They deserve uh, rights, and there's good reasons why of certain laws and, and traditions, and this is why maybe not all provisions of American law apply, or maybe not for possibly not even all constitutional protections. Um, nonetheless, I think the, the backdrop to that uh, very much that is the, the this the racial backdrop to the to this uh, to this cultural distinction is uh, I mean I think those go hand in hand uh, I mean obviously I've given in my talk I talk about the importance of strategic concerns but as the point is that they wanted strategic concerns but they were non-white populations that means that they have to create this um, this uh, liminal status this kind of political limbo that they're, they're in well I um I think that there was definitely a racial background to the cases, and I think that's rather obvious from some of the um, statements by the justices themselves, and, and the whole history of how the cases uh, came to the court. And the debate, as Christina well said uh, before, the debate uh, between anti-imperialist and imperialist, it was a racist debate, <laughs> basically, with different implications. Uh, so you can find in the cases um, statements that support the uh, 
the uh, conclusion that there was this racial uh, conservation uh, in the background. In fact, uh, in, the, in the Balzac case, uh, Justice Taft, when he tries to make a distinction between Alaska and Puerto right. Rico, he says expressly, you know, Alaska is different. Alaska is sparsely populated. It's easily amenable to, um, uh, to control by um, Anglo-Americans. And he says that, you know, it's almost in those words. And, um, and this is a different place. And the, the difference rely, uh, lies in the um, ethnic and language uh, differences, etc. So I, I don't have any doubt that the, the, the whole, you know, all the cases are permeated by that. Now, uh, how much can we gain from highlighting that aspect of the cases? That's your question. Um, well, I think one thing that has um, has been done is to say, well, these cases relied on these racist notions, so they they should no longer be considered valid law. They should be abandoned. I mean, we are in a different world. Yeah. That uh, relies either on one of two maybe notions. One that they were. I mean, that that racism was bad then. I mean, it was it was a, a terrible thing to do. Uh, with these populations. The other implication might be that, listen, we understand that you had these fears at the beginning of the 20th century about these populations maybe coming in, as some of the justices said, and, and pretending to govern us. You know, they were so different. But that's no longer a problem. That's no longer a problem because these populations have been somewhat assimilated. I mean, that would be like a, the reverse of a racist argument. Mm. You were right in deciding that at that moment. Now uh, there is no, there's no more um, uh, justification to do that. I, I don't like that argument, no. OK? I don't like that <laughs> argument. And uh, so um, I think one has to deal with that argument uh, very cautiously, yes. very cautiously. Just on that point, I was uh, just went to a paper a few days ago, and someone was quoting polling data showing that only 73% of respondents identified them as Amer it said Amer Americans was their identity, suggesting just the heterogeneous population in the United States and how that kind of earlier racial notions really no longer uh, obtain. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm. I'm just going to add a couple of thoughts. Um, so I took you to be asking, is racism essential to those holdings? Certainly, I think you mm. recognize racism is a part of the debate mm. and a part of what drove the holdings. Um, and the question of whether it's essential is this question of whether these cases can survive without, mm -hmm. without resting on those race, r racist premises. Um, and uh, you know, I, I think as the court reaffirms them, the court certainly understands itself to be, you know, the, the court, courts will make these comments, well, you know, they were the product of a, of, of, of a period of time in which people were racist in a way that, of course, we aren't now, and by reaffirming the holdings, we're not reaffirming that. That's, that, there, that is said in one form or another in the decisions, and I, I don't think it's that easy. So, you know, on the one hand, one has to acknowledge change, and on the other hand, it's not that easy. And so, um, this, you know, and so I should have started by saying this is a, a question that, that tortures me and this comment, you know, Plessy had its brown, when mm -hmm. will the insular cases have their brown? People mm -hmm. ask me this all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and I always want to say, you know, I always want to say that's just really, it doesn't work that way. And yet I want to examine in myself, why doesn't it work that way? I mean, am I doing the same thing? Am I saying, let's separate these holdings out from their racist premises? It, it cannot be done. Mm -hmm. And so I think going to the question of, you know, what one gains from drawing attention to it, well, um, there is, one cannot see uh, that legal framework as, you know, a legal framework in which, let's say, the United States, it, holds Guantanamo over Cuba's objections, okay? Um, you can look at Boumediene as a case that says, well, at least the insular cases don't prevent habeas from applying. Mm -hmm. But if you keep remembering the past and keep asking yourself, you know, how, how'd we get here? Then the real question is, what are they doing there again? Why did Guantanamo, as I think Amy Kaplan puts it, when, when did it turn into a prison camp? I keep asking that question because habeas here matters a great deal, but the entire, mm -hmm 
context in which this is unfolding also matters, and it's a context with a history. Um, uh, that's one thing. Um, I, I guess, relatedly, right, when we, we talk about, uh, uh, Efren uh, referred to in his remarks that talk about flexibility in the cases, um, and uh, the idea that uh, you know, these cases would, would give Congress sort of the latitude and the United States the latitude to do what it needed to do in the world. Um, every time the cases are cited for that proposition, which is what's happening in the, ex in the context of, of extraterritoriality, extraterritor one needs to investigate again, what is it possible to imagine when one somewhere sees people as other hmm. and somehow amenable to one's control? Um, so, you know, it, it's a way of sort of sh shining a, a spotlight on, on the content, uh, or let me put it differently, it's a way of, of preventing more sort of, you know, sanitized rhetoric about sort of the need for flexibility in international relations with, with what it is, what attitudes it is that drive the sense that one has, that a, that a nation has the prerogative to project its power. Um, so, so continuing to, to return to them, it's, it's more complicated than just racism for mm -hmm. sure, and yet returning mm -hmm. to that past enables one to interrogate them in the present in ways that I think are crucial um, uh, as, as part of a way of sort of ex examining the claims to power that are made on their basis. Um, so yeah, but I, I just find it a, a really difficult question for sure. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Um, <clears throat> Let me open the floor to questions from the audience. Yeah, you know, it's a, the last point about uh, the racial element is interesting because in the case of Alaska, um, I'm pretty sure the Treaty with Russia uh, talked about the, that the inhabitants would be treated like citizens by the United States, but I think it excluded like the Eskimos. And, um, and, uh, but, uh, you know, I think more broadly, I'd ask the question, what's more racist? The, in the context of uh, Professor Duffy uh, uh, and her, 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 the narratives that she uh, delineated, what's more racist? The anti-imperialists who said, these people are different, we shouldn't govern them, or the imperialists who said, these people are different, we're just going to govern them, but we're not going to recognize their sovereignty, and we're going to basically colonialize them. What was more racist? I think it's an interesting question. But I wanted to back up and just say that I, I think everybody did a fantastic job and nobody said anything that I don't completely agree with in this audience. <laughs> those, people, those people who uh, are here that don't know about the answer cases, I think just were given a great gift by all, all of you and I would really commend you on, on your presentations. But I would like to augment, not disagree with, but augment it a little bit. I find it, I find it interesting, you know, Professor Duffy, the, um, the, 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 the alternative scenario that you laid out about Cuba and how we adopted the model of using a constitutionalism in the context of an international relationship to establish what the status was going to be. And that that, the, that was a good model, or it worked in the case of Cuba. Uh, it seemed to be what you were saying. I'm, maybe, maybe you didn't think it worked. But uh, at least Cuba became independent. Its status was resolved. Its status wasn't left unresolved. Um, and that model of constitutionalism you also referred to was, in essence, the Manifest Destiny model. It was the process by which we incorporated territories into the Union through a process of having them adopt constitutions and then Congress admits them into the Union, at least. And I, I guess that took its purest form in the case of, uh, uh, you know, Wyoming and um, uh, Washington and the Dakotas, um, uh, where Congress basically passed a statute saying, um, you must do a constitution, and if you don't do one, you got to go back and have, if your convention doesn't work this time, you got to go back and do it again until you get a constitution that the people vote for, and then you'll be admitted to the union. But the point is that model of constitutionalism, where you define status based on working out a constitution with the inhabitants that establishes their identity, their citizenship, their status, and consequently the status of the territory, really goes back to the Northwest Ordinance. And that, is, that was the model, and I think it's, you know, it, when we go back and look at history, it's interesting that, that Thomas Jefferson wrote the Northwest Ordinance when he was in the Continental Congress in, what, 1787, and then when they did the Constitutional Convention, Thomas Jefferson was over in Paris. I think if Thomas Jefferson had been at the Constitutional Convention, there would have been a provision in the Constitution that did, in very short form, what the Northwest Ordinance did. And that's indicated by the fact that the first thing the new Congress did under the Constitution was it passed the Northwest Ordinance, and we need to deal with this issue. 
And so it is a founding document. So this is, now that sets the stage for my question. <laughs> uh, and it's hard, you know, when you're in an audience like this, you guys talk about so much and it's hard to, you know, narrow it down to questions. I just didn't want to set that little uh, predicate there. But I think that what was, what was missing, what I would add to the discussion today, um, was the fact in, in, in your 13 elements um, and, and in your alternative scenarios, you know, there are other narratives that we could be looking at in addition to the ones. Like, for example, um, you talked about the Northern Mariana Islands, but you didn't talk about the trusteeship more broadly. That's an interesting narrative where, in essence, the United Nations gave us permission to do what we did under the insert cases for the people of Micronesia that had been under Japanese occupation. And it was like international colonialism. It was, it was internationally sanctioned imperialism, if you will. It allowed us to govern people. They had no sovereignty. They had no citizenship. They had no nationality. The only nationality citizenship sovereignty they had was what Congress uh, uh, provided by statute in implementing the trusteeship agreement. So what did we do with that model? Well, in essence, in a strange way, if you look at it, we went back to the Northwest Mor Ordinance model. We went back and let them adopt constitutions, and then based on their adoptions of their constitutions, we negotiated with them. So, uh, Thank you, thank you. Well, so, can we, can we let them respond so okay. that we have others with questions? Understood, if you don't mind. thank you. So um, I'll, I'll, be, I'll just address one part of it. Uh, there was a lot good there, and uh, um, I'm not gonna claim I agreed with all of it, but I agreed with a lot of it. Um, uh, I just want to say uh, I can understand why it comes across, uh, why my paper came across as sort of it, suggesting that the alternative model of the Platt Amendment and the constitutionalization of international relations worked, um, mainly because I said, you know, enough said, I'm moving to my autonomous. The last thing I'm going to do in my own presentation is displace the Puerto Rican autonomists. But it didn't work. Um, and again, in my work, what I try to show is What's interesting about why it didn't work that isn't captured in a historiography that is obsessed with nationhood as the lodestar. Um, so, so I said I'd be brief, so I'm going to be brief. On the one hand, it didn't work. That is, uh, Cubans were outraged by it. It was just, it was completely mishandled. And, and, and that debate at the convention that I alluded to um, featured a lot of the delegates saying, you know, we all know we've got asymmetrical relations with the United States. Did they have to write it down? Did they have to ram it into our constitutional text? This is so, uh, you know, unsubtle. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it goes on, okay? So, uh, so on the one hand, there's a, there's a complicated story for why it didn't work. What ends up happening is that the Platt Amendment becomes a way in which, you know, it, it becomes a, a sort of a source of contention among Cubans who, who, who fight with each other and then, and then ask the United States to come in and intervene because things are unstable. So to oversimplify a history. On the other hand, right, the question that, that one question, so many questions torture me, I keep alluding to that maybe. <laughs> this is a, a little therapy session for me. <laughs> On the other hand, the Platt Amendment, if, if you look at it in a vacuum, which it's much more autonomy than the Puerto Rican autonomous ever asked for. So, how is, so what is it about these histories? What does one have to make sense of to figure out why it is that Cubans, we all, Cubans, everybody, remember the Platt Amendment as this egregious imperial imposition, which it was for sure. And yet, the Puerto Rican autonomy, I'm talking about this incredibly elaborate vision, which I think really deserves to be thought about much more closely than it has been. How, what were they thinking, this multiple national constitutionalism thing that was supposed to fit within American federalism, right? And yet it is much more subordinate, again, if you look at them in a vacuum, than the Platt Amendment. So, so one would have to do a lot more to, 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 to parse that out, but I just wanted to address that. Okay. Wonderful your question. Yes, good morning. I would like to clarify that this question would probably come up in further panels. However, since it was talked about now, I think it's the best moment to bring it up. Uh, Professor Rivera, you explained that the elements of these cases have two ways of being resolved, either judi judicially or politically. Uh, for example, freedom of expression, among others, is to be resolved in courts. Uh, those pertaining to the relations between Puerto Rico and the U.S. are to be resolved politically. Uh, my question is, specifically in the case of Puerto Rico, um, existing a, uh, 
a right to self auto determination. Uh, countries have a right to be independent, however, not to be a state. For example, uh, is it not? Isn't it a violation that could should be examined by the courts? Uh, as we face inaction from those who are called upon to resolve it, who are the politicians? Well, that's a very good question. Uh, I would like to clarify that what I was saying was that the court itself constructed this distinction between constitutional claims and political claims. Um, and I know that uh, some people are uh, trying to use the judicial system to address the political question, uh, the, the political status question in Puerto Rico. Um, my own sense is that that's not the way to go, that it won't go any place. Um, but your question about the international obligations is interesting, whether you could somehow uh, bring to the attention of the court that the US is failing to comply with international obligations, with international law. Um, well, uh, I think that that would that could have some possibilities if we were in another country. <laughs> uh, but you know what is the attitude of the U.S. in general, including the courts about international law. And after Texas, as uh, Medellin v. Texas, uh, and you know that jurisprudence. Uh, it, it is very difficult, I think it would be very difficult to say that the international right to self-determination has become domestic law in the U.S. so that the co a court would somehow uh, come up with a remedy in order for that right to be exercised fully by the people of the territories. I, I just see it far flung in, in the political and legal environment of, of the U.S. Your question? Uh, I would like to ask you, uh, you talked earlier about the racial thing. Uh, I would like to comment that I think the racial thing in the insular cases may be related to how the way the U.S. and the Congress from the beginning saw uh, the, these terrorists for example, uh, I think until today they think uh, that the inhabitants of these territories don't have uh, the, let me see how to say, the, the intellectual ability to determine the way they, they, they want to go. For example, from 1933 to until now all presidents have come in, in another way that they support the autodetermination of Puerto Rico, but we have uh, plebiscites and they have done nothing. Uh, sometimes they send money to educate or to help resolve the task force. But I think that uh, the way the insular case, uh, cases may be applied today or not uh, may have come uh, from the Congress as, as the way they view the inhabitants of these territories. Until, the, until they do not realize there is a problem with them, there's nothing that we can do because if they always will think that the habitants of these territories don't have uh, the potential to, uh, to self auto determinate themselves, then we will not do nothing. If, uh, we could, uh, for example, we, uh, there have been presidents that have said that they want, uh, for example, Puerto Rico to be an ex, and that was at the President uh, Ford in 1974. So uh, I see a little bit incongruence in the way they see today uh, the inhabitants of this territory. So I wanted to make the statement that maybe the racial uh, themes that we can see in the opinions of the judges in the insular cases may be related to the way they see the people and the way they see if they, can, they have the educated level to auto-determine themselves. Thank you. Thank you. And one last quick question, please. Sure. 
Thanks again for organizing this conference. My name is uh, Neil Weir. Uh, I'm the president of an organization, We the People Project, that believes in using the courts and impact litigation to help achieve equal rights and representation for the over 4 million Americans living in this area. And I guess I would uh, pick on Professor uh, Rivera Ramos, uh, but I'm interested in hearing what the others had to say. He was a professor of mine while I was at Yale. Um, <laughs> be interesting in hearing uh, more of your thoughts about uh, the role of courts and judges in addressing these long-standing issues. I know that Judge, to Judge Toya has written about, uh, you know, kind of since uh, judges helped kind of broke the system, do they have some, some role in, uh, some special obligation to help fix it? Uh, and in, particularly in light of recognizing that the civil rights movement really wouldn't have been the same uh, had uh, the political advances of the civil rights movement really wouldn't have been the same or possible without removing the framework of separate but equal uh, under the plus, under Plessy. Um, can the civil rights for Americans in these areas move forward so long as that framework continues to exist, particularly given that as during the earlier civil rights movement, residents of these areas are really marginalized and disenfranchised from the political process? Is that a question? Mm -hmm. uh, one yeah. quick, so quick, quick response. What's the special role of judges, and, and, and can, can there be political advances so long as this framework of separate and unequal continues to exist? Is that, is that realistic? Well, I think it depends on, on the kind of claim that you're bringing to the court, actually, and whether the courts uh, think that this is a constitutional claim or a political claim in, you know, in the framework that the, that the case is uh, developed. And um, I, th I think that's why I think this, this is a complex uh, matter because it depends on you know the type of specific claim that you're making, and in, in, uh, and the extent to which that specific claim calls for a uh, abandonment of one of the many um, aspects of the insular cases. So I mean, it would be I think it, you would have to to address that question uh, case by case. Um, however, in my view, the closer you get to political rights, I think the, the, the uh, fewer opportunities you would have um, getting a, a resolution from the court. And of course, you can, you can, you can question the, the distinction. You can say, what, what, you know, what, that doesn't make any sense. Political cl constitutional claims are also political claims. Political claims should be um, especially fundamental political claims, rights of participation, all that should be um, sort of uh, protected by the Constitution. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good argument, but it doesn't fall, uh, I'm sorry to say, within the framework developed by the insular cases. And what you see is that court after court, as, as um, you have said, court after court keeps reproducing the framework of the insular cases, and they keep um, reproducing the, this distinction. So they will say, you know, cases, the Igartua case, uh, Igartua cases from Puerto Rico, you know, and, um, you know, do Puerto Ricans have a right to vote in federal elections? No, that's for the Congress to decide, or, or that's for the people of the U.S. to decide. It, it re would require an amendment to the U.S. Constitution. So the, the courts have been basically carving out a space in which they want, into which they won't go in, this, in these areas. And, and that's how I see it. Well, we're just, get start, get, just getting started on the 13 points, but we have to end here. <laughs> Thank you so much to the panelists. <laughs>